Jesus' feeding of 5,000 people is one of his more well-known miracles. And like most of them, Jesus uses what's around him, what he has, to accomplish something amazing. Jesus used a few barrels of water to make wine. He used a bit of mud to cure a blind man's sight. He uses people's faith to perform other wonders. At one point while visiting Nazareth, we're told that he couldn't do anything because of his former neighbor's unbelief. Jesus, even Jesus, needs something to work with. He can't perform miracles without some help or at least some raw materials. As we'll see in this text, Jesus multiplies several loaves of bread, but he can't just summon it out of thin air. And that's where we come in. A reading from the book of Matthew. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowd. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Please pray with me. Everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon all of our hearts serve to glorify you. And may they be in keeping with the teachings and the ministry of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Potlucks. Receptions, cocktail parties, Sunday brunch, Oktoberfest, whatever the occasion, you can rest assured that you will enjoy the finest cuisine when folks from this congregation throw a party. This church knows how to cook. I don't, but I've really been expanding my repertoire over the last few months. In addition to making peanut butter, Toast and bologna sandwiches. I can now boast a few other culinary delights, like hamburger helper. Every autumn, our church hosts what we call the progressive dinner. We gather at one house for drinks and appetizers, and then progress to different uh, homes uh, in smaller groups for dinner. While the folks hosting dinner prepare an entree, everyone else brings an appetizer or a side dish or something sweet and last year, I signed up to bring a side dish to complement the main course. I was discussing this uh, ahead of time with Sherry Flugel, who was uh, hosting appetizers that year, just a few days before the event. What are you planning to bring to dinner? She asked me. I was thinking I would just maybe bring a baguette. I replied, Seth. She explained, like a mother, gently correcting her children. You can't just bring a baguette to a potluck. A plain baguette from Jewel Osco is not a side dish. <laughs> That's true, I said. A baguette is so much more. <laughs> Warm and crusty on the surface, soft and inviting beneath. It only costs a couple of dollars, but it's enough to feed several people. And its culinary potential is endless, sliced and buttered along 
side a crisp salad or a bowl of pasta, a warm ham and cheese sandwich on a November afternoon with a cup of tomato soup, sliced lengthwise with a bit of sauce and cheese. You can even make your own French bread pizza, though I have not been bold enough to attempt anything that fancy myself. I had a friend in college, an atheist, who was persuaded of God's existence after eating a banana. For some reason, he found it to be a compelling argument for intelligent design. For my part, I think the baguette is a better candidate. I know God didn't invent it, per se, but what else could create the people that did? Anyway, feeling a little unsure of myself at this point, a little insecure about my offering, I called the host and asked her what kind of side dish I ought to bring. Oh, just a baguette would be fine, <laughs> she replied. I never felt so vindicated in all my life. I have to wonder, though, if she only said that because her expectations were so low. I think everyone knows I tend to show up to these sorts of things with pretty disappointing fare, like the time I brought a wilted salad that I'd put a dressing, uh, the dressing on the day before and left in my refrigerator overnight, or the time I'd stop by a local bakery before a church event, uh, only to find out they didn't take credit cards and you know the cupcakes were a little bit pricey and I only had a little cash on me, so I showed up to the party with just one of them. As I arrived at the gigantic spread of artisanal cheeses and biscotti, the bowls of homemade artichoke dip, the plates of imported salami and steaming teriyaki meatballs, I placed my little cupcake at the edge of the table, feeling like I hadn't contributed much of anything at all. Many years ago, in November of 2009, Scientists at CERN, the particle physics laboratory in Europe, were conducting a test of the Large Hadron Collider. I can't pretend to understand even a fraction of the science involved, but this particular accelerator is supposed to recreate the conditions of the Big Bang. Now, in and of itself, that strikes me as a little bit dangerous. It's not the sort of thing you can afford to mess up. I saw Oppenheimer a couple of weeks ago when it came out, uh, which, of course, dealt with the creation of the first atomic bomb. And one of the risks there, according to the math, was that the bomb could start a chain reaction that would ignite the atmosphere and destroy the entire world. The best they could determine after running the numbers over and over again was that the risk was close to zero. The only way to find out for sure was to actually test it. Theory will only get you so far. Oppenheimer nervously mumbled to a colleague on the screen. Similarly, there was some talk 15 years ago about the Large Hadron Collider producing a black hole in the middle of Switzerland. Fortunately, that didn't happen, but it speaks to the anxiety surrounding experiments like these. You don't want to mess them up. As they fired up the particle accelerator, everything was going smoothly until the power suddenly went out, creating a spike in temperature in one of the collider's cooling plants that shut the whole thing down. And upon investigation, it was discovered that a small bird had dropped a few crumbs of bread into one of the compensating capacitors, creating an electrical shortage. They found the bird just outside the open panel, munching on the remains of a baguette. It was a relatively minor setback, and the world did not end that day. Even so, there are some who believe that the incident triggered a split in reality, sending the entire world hurtling into an alternate timeline. Sounds crazy, but when I look around at this bizarre world, I sometimes can't help but wonder if it might be true. Still, it's doubtful that anything as small as a bird or a few crumbs of bread could change the, horse, the course of history. No more than a single cupcake can make or break a potluck dinner. There's a lot of proverbial wisdom about small creatures accomplishing great things. J.R.R. Tolkien wrote, such are the course of deeds that move the wheels of the world. 
Small hands do them because they must, while the eyes of the great are elsewhere. And the Bible, of course, is full of such wisdom, from David, an awkward, gangly teenager destined to be king, to Jesus, the poor son of a carpenter born in the middle of nowhere, both of whom left their mark on history and changed the world. It's a common theme in Jesus' parables, too. Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed or a pearl or a small measure of yeast, something tiny, minuscule even, that changes everything. Now, having said all that, if we think we can change the world or accomplish great things all by ourselves, we are sorely mistaken. As Token also wrote, Only a small part is played in great deeds by any hero. And as Jesus illustrates in this story about feeding all of these people, even he can't do it alone. Jesus doesn't just create a baguette ex nihilo out of nothing, producing bread out of thin air. He can't just produce a baguette from beyond. He needs help. He needs people. Before Jesus performs his miracle, his disciples manage to scrounge up five loaves of bread and two fish, presumably gathered from the folks in the crowd. And miraculously, when a little is shared, a multitude is fed. When people share what they have, contribute even a little to a larger effort, amazing things can happen. Miraculous things. Dr. King didn't strike a blow to Jim Crow on his own. Nelson Mandela didn't put an end to South African apartheid on his own. Harvey Milk didn't pave the way for gay rights on his own. Jane Addams didn't achieve women's suffrage on her own. Only a small part is played in great deeds by any hero. The rest depend on the ones who join their cause. No one can change the world alone, not even Jesus. If he could, why take on disciples? Why preach at all? Why empower people like Peter and Paul to build a church? Because together, we can perform miracles. And given the state of this crazy world that we find ourselves in, our disintegrating social contract, our eviscerated politics, our irreconcilable divisions, our burning planet, we could certainly use a miracle or two. When I think about that lonely cupcake that I left on the table at the party that night, it feels like a metaphor for much of my life and my work. Like most pastors, most people, I'm sure, I suffer from imposter syndrome. I don't always feel worthy of the office I hold. I don't always feel like I bring enough to the table. I don't always feel worthy of the tasks before me. And you know what? Sometimes I'm not. Last week, I got really sick. You can still hear it a little in my voice. Tested negative for COVID, but it was Pretty bad. At first, I thought it was just a cold, but then I found myself in bed for three days, completely fatigued, nursing a headache that wouldn't go away. I slept a lot, but my dreams were plagued by minute details that looped in endless circles, like trying to reconcile a grocery receipt over and over again that doesn't quite add up, if that makes any sense. I couldn't get much done, but I had a reliable staff to depend on. As it turns out, half of them also got sick, uh, but the rest of them kept the ship sailing. Thank God we don't have to do all of this alone. Now, that being said, I still had to write this sermon. You're probably thinking I'm telling you this so you won't judge it too critically. (laughs) Well, that's true. I am. (laughs) I was not of sound mind or body when I wrote most of it. (laughs) These may well be the lunatic ramblings of a man in the grip of fever. Friends, sometimes we can't bring much to the table. As one of my favorite Nick Cave songs goes, there comes a time when you just cannot deliver. 
This is a fact. This is a stone cold truth. But that's the beauty of community. Sometimes we can give a lot. And sometimes we can hardly give anything at all. There comes a time for each and every one of us when you just can't do it, when you just cannot deliver. But together, in time, we do enough to make a difference. This might be the remnants of the fever talking, but having recovered, it still rings true. We are like the breadcrumbs of a great and wondrous baguette from beyond. We are all slivers of a universal consciousness that we call God, something greater than ourselves that exists beyond our wildest imagination. And those crumbs, small as they are, small as we are, add up to something. Of course, this is all theory, and theory will only get you so far. So let's keep on contributing our unique gifts and talents and see if we cannot accomplish miraculous things together. And I've got to say it just this one time. That cupcake cost $7, and it was probably delicious. <laughs> Amen.